Uh, I'm Michael Cater. I'm a PGY3, originally from the DC metro area. Okay. Yeah, my name is Josh, Josh Burks. So I'm one of the uh, fourth years here. Uh, I'm uh, from uh, Oklahoma originally. Okay. How you doing, sir? I'm Mario Jamshidi. I'm one of the PGY fours as well, uh, also from the DC area. Okay. I'm Damian. I'm one of the interns. Um, went to medical school here, but originally from Pennsylvania. Okay. Uh, my name is Ashish. Sorry, I'm a little informal today. I'm a little, I'm out of town with the, the family, so <laughs> driving back to Miami. But I'm one, I'm one of the chief residents uh, here. I'm from uh, originally from Texas, but I've been in Miami for about 14 years now. Okay, I'm nice to meet you. So you got a kid? Yeah, I got a little two year old who's kind of <laughs> running a terror right now. So that's always fun. Awesome. awesome. <laughs> And uh, the rest of the, the residents are on their way. They're just walking in. They, you know, we had virtual uh, grand rounds, so they, they're just walking into the conference room right now. Yeah, no, it's fine. I, we, you know, we got a few minutes. Uh, Carrie, said, thank, hi, Carrie. How are you? Hi, Dr. Drake. I'm having one of your muffins. They're great. So glad you're enjoying. A, a meal <laughs> unto itself. How's uh, how's George Ibrahim treating you? Oh, Dan, George is uh, on fire up here. He's uh, taken over basically. <laughs> uh, we I, I I did my pizza rotation with him when he was a fellow, so we had a, a really, really good time together. Oh no, all we, of us. Uh, we love George. He's now the busiest guy of all of us, right? <laughs> that's good. That's good. <laughs> yeah, I keep you know if you ever ask him to take a call, he says, "Yep." Yeah. No problem, and uh, he's doing deep brain stimulation for epilepsy and for um, self-injurious behavior. He recently did a kid with that. He's you know he's doing a lot of functional neurosurgery. He's really pushing the envelope, so it's great. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah he's uh you know I think I get, I think I made him gain like about ten to fifteen pounds while he's here uh, for fellowship, just giving him pizza basically every day. So <laughs> yeah, he, but uh, you know he's. He took Uber, I think, every day to work and back or something. He was telling me, and uh, you know, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. He was. Uh, he he taught us a lot about uh, just because you know our PGY three rotation is kind of like our intro to neurosurgery, like our like, intro to the operating room kind of thing. So, um, you know, I think that you know having him there was like a huge benefit for all of us. Uh, um, hopefully, Ian and Shelby, my other co chiefs, will be able to join. But they were, I think, we learned. A, ton from him so uh give him our regards no i will i will yeah <clears throat> no he's got his lab up and running he's got a couple of uh, phd students uh, no george is great i to keep telling him he's got to get a life i mean he he lives across the street from the hospital and uh if he's not in the hospital he's in his lab so uh yeah, we tried to introduce him to a few like a uh, few people down here, but you know I don't think it ever took off. So, <laughs> okay. um, yeah, but I, you know the program you guys have in Toronto is pretty amazing. Like, I think like every single one of your every single one of the faculty there just have so many like just big like you know uh, kind of game changing research projects. I think that you know it's kind of a model for us to follow. So, I'd love to hear your opinions on how you guys set that up and. And how and how your faculty are kind of positioned for success because you know like you know every time you look up any one of the Toronto faculty it's always you know they you know, always you know have the landmark paper in whatever field they're working in so it's always something to aspire to. Yeah, I mean we're pretty proud of ourselves, but uh, you know could always be better. Yeah. Is there a big engineering school associated like like one of the top engineering schools in Toronto? I, was, I just didn't, sorry, I didn't quite hear you. Is, is there like a big engineering school? Is that where you get a lot of your, your uh, uh, people working with in your lab with you? Yeah, no, the University of Toronto is a big university. I think it's almost 100,000 students now. And um, they have a large engineering school. Um, we also have um, 
um, the University of Waterloo, which is about uh, an hour and a half away. And um, it's a uh, hard sciences university. And we get a lot, we actually get more students from there. They have a huge mechatronics program and they have a co-op system. So they, they um, have uh, one semester on and then one semester off and they go all year round. And so um, for, um, and, and they're, and they're, their semester off is like a work experience, but they can work in a lab. So a lot of them come as part of that. And that's been, they've been really, really good. So, so, so we've had both. We've had, um, you know, fair number of international students as well come who've got an engineering background. Um, and then they've come to Toronto and, you know, ended up in our lab. So it's, it's, it's a real mixture. It's funny, I was uh, <clears throat> talking to my dad last night. I mentioned that you were coming as a visiting lecturer and he said, oh, because he's also a neurosurgeon, he trained at Columbia and he asked if your father was coming to speak and he, I said, no, and his son. And he actually, your father came as a visiting lecturer when my dad was a resident. <laughs> so it's funny how it comes full circle a little bit. Yeah, that's, that's interesting, yeah. Well, I have, a son, I have a son who's a neurosurgeon. Three generations. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm not sure. <laughs> Otherwise unemployable. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you guys want to introduce yourselves? Yeah, we just had a few few other residents roll in here. Hey, how's it going? I'm Dr. I'm Mike Silva, one of the second years. Okay. I'm Mike. Uh, I'm Big Nash, one of the second years as well. Nice to meet you. Uh, Big Nash, Mike, tell, tell us where you're from and everything. Uh, yeah, I'm from Miami, uh, went to med school at Harvard, and um, yeah, second year here. Um, okay. Uh, uh, grew up, uh, I'm from the Midwest, um, and then went to med school in Albany, New York, um, and then came down. So uh, someone mentioned that you come to um, Miami Children's as a, or Nicholas Hospital as a PGY3, and that's where you do your, a lot of your clinical training. So how, how is the program set up? Like, what do you guys do? What do you people do in years one, two, and three, just, just for interest? So year one, uh, we spend, each year is three rotations out of four months each. Uh, so your intern year, you'll do a neurology rotation for four months. Uh, you can rotate through the neuro ICU, um, get a lot of your like critical procedures done there. Um, you are then move on to a cranial intern. Uh, so at Jackson Memorial, you're kind of running the show, learning how to manage, uh, you know, complicated uh, post-op patients, you know, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, a lot of the, the skull-based tumors that Dr. Morcos does. Um, so you're kind of running around, answering the pager, doing all sorts of stuff throughout the day. And then <clears throat> your final rotation is at University of Miami, which is uh, Dr. Komatar, Dr. Wang, Dr. Levy. So a lot of uh, cranial tumors, spine, uh, and again, you're you know in fielding consults, taking care of patients on the floor. Um, helping on the OR as much as you can. And then second year, uh, the three rotations, uh, you are back on the cranial service, but as a P but as a PGY2, it's a really great experience. You know, you're not the one holding the pager, you get to scrub all the cases. Um, so you're getting your first like intro to the OR, helping expose and all that. Um, and then you're also move on to your spine junior rotation. Um, Again, it's similar to your cranial intern, but except you're dealing with all the spine patients, uh, but you do get to go to the OR there as well. And then last year on the trauma uh, rotation with a little bit of PEDS coverage. Um, so that's kind of PGY2 year. PGY3, uh, we tend, we kind of go off campus a little bit. So like you mentioned, we have the pediatric rotation, uh, which has been really great. I'm, it's actually my second to last day on the rotation. I'll probably miss it a lot. Um, and then you go to UMH as a PGY3 and you're kind of, you know, workhorse there, scrubbing all the cases, uh, first one and last one out. Um, and then the VA is the last rotation. Um, most of the, most of the hospitals are all on the same campus except for children's. 
Um, and then fourth and fifth year historically are elective years. Um, our program is kind of transitioning to six and one actually now, where your fourth year will be an elective year, and then your fifth year is your uh, is just a PGY five. You rotate through spine, cranial, and UMH again as a senior resident, and then sixth year will be your chief year, and then seventh year will be another elective year. Um, how many residents have you got in the program? Twenty one. So three a year. And, um, uh, and do you do enfolded fellowships? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so typically those elective years are, most people do enfolded fellowships. Um, so either spine, functional, um, uh, neuro-oncology, endovascular, those are kind of the big ones. And, and that's in year five? A uh, year, well, historically it's year four and five. So one year, some, most, a lot of people do research um, and then another year they do a fellowship. But after my year, it'll be switching to the fourth and seventh year as elective years. That way, if you choose to hold a fellowship, you're doing it after your chief year. Okay, okay. Also, we have like, I think, like 10 or 11 like in external fellows as well doing the spine and peds and um endovascular so we have like around 31 or so trainees okay <clears throat> well, that's a big program yeah a lot going on um i guess we can get started we have quorum Uh, so first case, so this is a five-year-old male uh, with no significant past medical history who uh, presented to the ED with difficulty walking uh, coordination for two weeks, had two episodes of urinary incontinence and vomiting. Um, his exam was only notable for an upward gait palsy, some finger nose ataxia, otherwise intact. So we got a CT scan in the ED, which showed this large uh, third ventricular tumor um, some hyperdense uh, foci in there. Um, he was taken emergently to the operating room for placement of an EVD just to stabilize him. Um, so the, the differential at that time, uh, we were thinking uh, most likely a germinoma versus a uh, pendomoma. Um, but on the back of our mind, we also had meningioma and choroid plexus papilloma, even though it's kind of a atypical location in pediatric patients. Um, so once he was stabilized uh, with the EBD, we got an MRI, uh, pretty heterogeneously enhancing um, lesion. Um, so what, what we so we took him after that for uh, endoscopic biopsy. Uh, we did not uh, we we didn't get any markers in the CSF that were concerning for germinoma. So we felt like the next step was, uh, would be to biopsy it. Um, so the biopsy showed a WHO grade two meningioma. And so our question for you is, you know, what, what trajectory would you typically take in these kinds of patients and how aggressive would you be um, with this tumor? Uh, just considering its location and it seemed to be attached to the tectum um, in terms of trying to spare him radiation versus, you know, he's gonna get radiation anyways. Just wanted to see what your thoughts on this. Yeah, can, can, uh, you, go back? can you go back to the previous Yeah, slide? of course. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, an enormous tumor. And um, <clears throat> um, so, and you do get um, atypical. So many gelmas in kids um, tend to be unusual, uh, often in unusual places. And they also tend to be a bit more aggressive than uh, the adult counterpart. And um, an interventricular is not unknown. And um, 
my my first publication as a resident was on meningiomas and pediatric patients. So um, always kind of been interested in these, but I can't remember the last time I operated on one. Like they're really, really rare. Um, but um, gross total excision is what you would at least aspire to. It, it does look like its interface with, um, you know, the tectum uh, and top of the brainstem is not not that distinct, um, and um, it, it's it's large enough that it would be hard to remove in its entirety through one single approach. But um, that was that was our initial thought to do a staged approach, um, right. where we would do first part from anteriorly, um, and then I guess depending on what we saw intraoperatively, come posteriorly. Yeah, yeah. So I think I would come anteriorly first. Um, and just see how much, and um, I prefer to go transcolosal, um, and, um, but you could go transfrontal. I don't think it matters too much. You would do really want to be way forward for this, um, like almost on the hairline. And, um, and just, you know, just see how it came. And you could probably tell at that point um, to what extent, um, you could what what the interface was like with the with the brainstem. You'd probably get a pretty good idea whether or not you know it'd be worth going back and, and taking some more. Um, and the, the other the other way, I, and then I would if that and there was residual and it was it had a good plane. I didn't get all of them. I probably would go. I think from behind. You, you might you might be able to <clears throat> get it all out in a single go if you went a little bit more posterior and then went subcroidal. Um, you, you might get more of it out that way. I mean, technically you could take it all out from a posterior approach as well, but that is an extremely long reach. Um, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. So I, I mean, uh, yeah. So I, so I, I guess I, I'd probably go um, anteriorly first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we went pretty, we went anteriorly. And then the other consideration that we thought of while we we're in there was we actually, you know, did an open uh, third ventriculostomy in hoping that we could restore some CSF flow in him while we're in there. Uh, we did transcolosal interferon seal uh, for him. This is the post op scan. Uh, Try to get a good slice of, you know, the third ventriculostomy. But once we were in there, <clears throat> it, this tumor was very heavily involved uh, with the uh, tectum, and so she, uh, our attending, felt like it it would we would be doing more harm than good to try to pursue a gross total resection. Right. And I guess another question for you is, you know, how does the, the pathology play into how aggressive you're going to be? Our thoughts were he has an atypical meningioma. He's already bought himself radiation regardless. Um, so by doing gross total resection and possibly giving, you know, harming him a little more, I think our thought was to not do the posterior approach afterwards and, you know, he's going to get the radiation, we'll just continue to watch him. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, so I, I think these, uh, the tumors in kids are hard to grade, right? And as I said, they don't, they're, I think they're very unlike anything that you see in an adult. And, um, and and they and they do have a definitely have a higher recurrence rate, um, but no, I mean if this is involving the um, you know the midbrain, uh, then no, I would not try and go for a for a growth total. And you you're probably not going to reduce. So if you decide to radiate them, I mean you're probably not going to reduce the radiation field much by taking out more tumor. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I, th I think that's reasonable. I mean, we might just watch this for a bit just to see what transpires and um, and not go right to radiate. He's five, right? Uh, radiation. Yeah. And um, I don't know, we'd probably use proton beam, I guess. Uh, we have yeah. to send patients to the States for that, but anyway. Yeah, so that, that's the plan. He's going to go for proton beam uh, radiation. Okay. Okay. So it, it's shown uh, survival benefit. But uh, he, he actually... We were able to, after postoperatively, because we did the open third ventriculostomy, uh, he had an EBD postoperatively. We clamped it, which he tolerated well. Um, so we took out the EBD. 
but he returned to clinic two weeks later with a very large pseudomeningocele. Um, so we, he, he actually ended up getting shunted, even though we did, uh, you know, the third ventriculostomy, I guess the thought was that the CSF took the path of least resistance, which was just out the top of his head. Um, I don't know if you felt, feel like we should have been more aggressive about, you know, watching, watching him for, for the shunt or, or I guess just the ETV would have been. Was, was the ETV still patent? The ET, I mean, it was a very large ETV just because we were able to do it uh, openly. We didn't have to use a balloon or anything like that. Um, so it was a fairly large ETV. Um, okay. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, um, when, when you have an open ventricle like that to the outside, it's often really hard to control. And um, the fact that you've, um, you know, created a bypass from the occluded aqueduct doesn't mean that he's not going to be shunt independent. And, um, he, I, you know, he can sometimes get into more trouble by trying to, um, you know, um, get away without a shunt um, in terms of, you know, getting an infection or something. So no, I think, I think that would be very reasonable. And, um, you know, I wouldn't do, I think I would shunt the ventricle and um, yeah. And then, and then he's plan for work hooked on me. Yeah, no, I, I think I'd probably do the same thing. Okay. <clears throat> um, all right. So we'll go on to the next one. Um, so this is, a uh, 20 month old male who was uh, found to have holoprosencephaly and hydrocephalus at birth. Uh, he was born at 40 weeks without complication. They, this was at the outside hospital. The mother was told that he would pass if, we, if they didn't do any intervention. Uh, so due to the prognosis, the mother decided to do compassionate extubation. Um, however, he was able to breathe on his own. He did not pass. Um, so he continues to survive and his head circumference continued to jump percentiles um, and they finally shunted him at 16 months. Um, he came to us as a proximal uh, shunt malfunction one month later, um, but here, I just wanna go through his uh, imaging with you, just so you can sort of, he's got no, no brain basically. Um, Got like a fused thalamus, um, that's pretty much it in a brain stem. Right. Um, sorry. He does. He does have some cortical mantle. It's extremely thin, but he does very have thin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so when he came to us, we attempted uh, a CPC. Obviously, you can't do an ETV for these patients, um, and then placement of the EVD. Um, over the course of the month, his CSF output remained high. Um, and so they felt like they weren't gonna be able to wean the EVD on him. So he was taken for a shunt revision, which he did well with over the course of the next year or so. Um, and then he presented back recently uh, with shunt valve blockage, underwent a revision, and then he returned again another half, month and a half later, same, same story, valve blocked um, and went revision with the Delta. And so this is how he presents to us, uh, just these sagittal images. Basically, he presents with this increase in this posterior fossa uh, collection with a downward herniation of his brainstem. Um, and then I guess the main issue for him is this CSF profile. He comes in, he's got uh, hypothalamic dysfunction. So he has fevers a lot of the time. Well, he ends up getting tapped. White blood cells are always high. His RBCs are always high, and his protein is very, very high. Sure. Um, so, just a, a, a large discussion on this patient. You know, initially, what was the role for you know CPC for him? What are, are the ethics of continuing these revisions, uh, considering his prognosis? He's never going to be normal. Um, issues with CSF dynamics in a patient without a brain, because a lot of CSF dynamics is contingent upon having a brain pulsatile push uh, the pressure dynamics pushing the CSF into the Bernal Roman spaces and just his CSF profile that it, he's prone to continue to block these valves um, and if there's any preventive measures that you guys tend to take in these types of patients or how, how you guys manage these yeah no, I mean this this is a really interesting case on on many levels and um, you know it has both ethical and, um, you know, um, 
clinical care issues and it's always really hard and um and you know babies who basically have a brain stem um can thrive for a fairly long you know period of time and um um just out of curiosity was was this uh, was this detected in utero it was yeah and it was it before uh, an elective termination date uh, it was not so they had to take the pregnancy to completion. Um, so, so, so is, is termination beyond whatever number of weeks? Is that allowed in Florida? That I'm not 100% sure about uh, what the legality is here. Okay, right. Because, I mean, um, so I just, you know, that it is uh, in Ontario. Uh, if you have a committee that is appropriately um, construed, um, they will, you know, on occasion, uh, terminate a pregnancy um, prior to, um, you know, at almost any age gestation, which is, raises a lot of other ethical issues. Um, the other thing that um, is practiced here, just, <laughs> and, uh, you know, we're actually actually nice people. I don't, don't really <laughs> But um, have you ever heard of cephalocentesis? Have you ever heard of that? Mm -mm. So they allow the mother to go into labor and then they put a large um, trocar basically through the presenting head and drain off um, enough CSF in order to deliver the head. Um, and it's got about a 96% mortality rate. So that's another uh, option that's wow. practiced that's, here. That's to make delivery easier on the mother, I guess. Yeah, that's that's yeah. So the mother doesn't have to have a C-section, and um, it's meant to facilitate, you know, the head coming out, and um, and that's practice. I would say more. No, it's not. It's obviously not something that it's done often, but it is. It is still done, which is also another. Interesting thing. You can tell I'm avoiding trying to figure out what to do here, but anyways, I'm just gonna, <laughs> um, but, uh, but those are the issues. And, and, and these children, um, they don't, they don't typically die unless they get some other illness. Right. And, um, and so, you know, telling a family that, that, um, that this child is definitely going to pass away is obviously um, you have to be very careful with that. I think not treating it initially is, is, is reasonable just to see, you know, what happens or if there's any other problems. Um, I have actually shunted a few of these kids and, um, and, and that's where, that's where the problems start in some sense, because once you start, it's very hard to stop. Right. And, um, the other thing that is sometimes done here um, is that um, they won't actually feed the kid, right? Mm -hmm. They'll provide comfort medications and, um, and intravenous solutions, not always, but they won't, won't necessarily provide nutrition. So that's another, that raises other ethical issues, which are, which are quite uh, significant. And um, you know, at, at, at what, at what stage, um, you know, could you change course here and withdraw? And, you know, I, I think, I think, um, you know, I think it, it depends on the local environment and, you know, like having an ethical review and discussion with the family. I mean, I have one family that sticks in my mind who um, was a patient just like this. I shunned them, they wanted everything done. They can, this, this child is extraordinarily developmentally delayed, but is now into his teenage years and the family adores this baby or this child, right? I mean, so it's, it's you know, you've you got to be a little careful about what your perspective is on this compared to what the family might think. Right. Um, so, and um, I'll talk a bit about this tomorrow about, you know, the surgeon's perception of the quality of life of a patient with a shunt and the patient's perception because they're they're a little different um so i think an etv cpc was actually uh, something worth trying because that might spare uh the um the uh, 
the shunt. Um, you know, I, I think that um, uh, um, when you let, you know, and we've got a few kids here, some of them, one of them in particular came from uh, East Africa who was never shunted and has a head that's so large that they can only be transported in an ambulance, right? So, that's, kind, so that's kind of what he's like. What's that? That's kind of what his head is like. His head is, you know, very much out of, it's almost, I think it's pretty bigger than my head almost. Yeah, no, no, this is just be way bigger than your head. That, that's <laughs> a, uh, not, not that you have a large head, but <laughs> anyways. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I don't know that you can say for sure that the CSF dynamics uh, and profile are necessarily different. Um, you know, as I said, there is some cortical mantle there and uh, the high protein level is, is, is interesting. And um, I'm not sure that that's typical, um, but when you do have it, it is really, really difficult to deal with. And I don't, I don't have a, you know, a good solution. I mean, sometimes, um, uh, and I haven't done this for, I don't know how many years, but you can just put in a straight tube without any valve, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and because it it tends to be the mechanisms that get clogged. If, if you actually test a shunt um, with high protein, it doesn't make any difference to how it flows. It's just that if the protein can accumulates, it'll block. I guess you you've obviously ruled out an infection, which would be one of the things that would cause this. Um, right. Yeah. Um, he, he tends to buy himself at least five days in the hospital each time he presents because we wait for the cultures to grow out and make sure that there's nothing going on. Uh, and then it's almost always a valve blockage. And he's presented at two to three times during my four month rotation alone. Yeah. Um, and the most recent time, I think the mother is sort of slowly coming to discussing, he's already DNR, DNI, um, yeah. but in terms of just withdrawing care, like, uh, the next time he presents, uh, with the shunt malfunction, um, yeah. that might be an, a bridge to cross the next time he comes. I yeah. think she was going to be more willing to do it this time uh, if it was an infection, because then he was going to be externalized, spend weeks in the hospital, then get re-internalized. And yeah. it's, it's a lot for the family um, yeah. and, and also the kid who's being put through all these procedures. So it, we started that discussion with them. I, I don't think she's ready. You know, I think the family... The family's religious and they felt like he's their little miracle because they were told he was going to die. Yeah. He didn't. Yeah. He, bre he breathed on his own. And so they're sort of, they're still very attached to him for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I thought it was a interesting, uh, I, we, ne we never thought of just not placing a valve. Um, I guess I'm, I'm wondering if there's a risk for subdural formation in these patients if you overdrain them even though there's really barely any cortical mantle? Um, yeah, there is, but it is also a, ri a risk if you have a valve in there. And um, um, when, when, I, um, when I did my fellowship in Paris, Christian St. Rose was there and he worked in, um, was it Algeria? He worked in Africa for a couple of years before he, um, he went into pediatric neurosurgery and he said they used to just put a straight piece of tubing in the kids. That's all they put in. It's all they had. And uh, he said it often worked just fine. He's the guy that invented the Orbis Sigma valve. If you ever heard of that valve? So he's, he knew all about CSF dynamics. Um, yeah. I mean, you, you worry that there's to and flow, fro, but to and fro flow because you know, there'd be absolutely no valve on it. The other thing you could try is a distal slit valve and put some extra slits in it so that uh, the protein starts to accumulate in the distal slit. It's got a long ways to go before it occludes all the slits. So, you know, or something like that would maybe be an option. But I mean, especially with the programmable valves, they do tend to get clogged um, with uh, protein. I mean, on occasion they do, and, and then you can't program them. So, I, I mean, <laughs> You know, I think putting something actually a lot simpler um, might be reasonable. I think if you, um, you know, you got into trouble with subdurals, that might be another uh, bridge that you 
you know, you have to think about, and and maybe that's the point where you say, okay, I, you know, there's nothing really we can do, but yeah, this is tough. I don't, I don't ever, I don't ever really get scared. <laughs> there's no good answer. <laughs> um, all right, perfect. Uh, next case, uh, Eva here. No, just not. Uh, well, we can come back to this one, I guess. Okay, yeah, so um, this was an interesting case that um, they had recently, it was this 15-year-old uh, girl um, who about uh, four months prior over the summertime had uh, this incidentally discovered um, what they called a, a Rathi's cleft cyst at the time. Um, and uh, they just had recommended observation, um, but then uh, over the winter, four, four or five months later, she came in to the emergency room, uh, basically with, with severe headache, photophobia, um, neck stiffness, um, nausea and vomiting. And uh, this was after she'd been to a couple of urgent care clinics in the, the few days prior um, with, the, with those same symptoms. Um, she'd also had fevers. Um, for about about five days, um, up to then she had she'd been uh, she'd been healthy, um, and uh, so this was this was the first time that, that we'd seen her in our clinic, and, and the first time she really needed to be in the hospital for anything. Um, because she'd had the uh, the cellar mass previously, um, she was seen in the ER. Uh, by the ophthalmology team, had uh, grade two papilledema and uh, a uh, hemianopsia. Next. So in the ER, uh, they drew some basic labs, did a lumbar puncture. Um, they didn't record an opening pressure. Um, she did have uh, leukocytosis within the, the CSF and uh, her uh, endocrine labs were, were normal. And uh, this was what was shown on the MRI, um, sort of this enhancing cyst-like lesion with, with supercellar extension. So she was taken to surgery um, uh, urgently for, for presumed uh, pituitary apoplexy, but uh, at the time of surgery, when they when they entered the cyst, it was uh, really just just looked like frank uh, pus. Um, it never grew anything positive in the cultures, and the the tissue sample that was sent to the lab was um, didn't contain any um, any type of neoplasm. They just saw a macrophage rich inflammation and then the immunohistochemistry uh, basically just stained for, for T cells, B cells and macrophages. So uh, the patient was uh, treated with antibiotics for several weeks um, based on the thought that this, this could have been a, a, a cellar abscess rather than a tumor. Um, although uh, obviously the cellar abscess is very rare uh, and uh, why I thought this would, would be a good case to, to discuss. Yeah, I mean, um, just based on the uh, imaging, um, you know, that's a relatively acute presentation. I don't know what her outside MRI. Yeah, it was much, it, it really did look like a Rathi's cleft cyst. It was just a very small area of enhancement. Um, didn't didn't look uh, nearly as impressive as this, and that so that would have been just over the course of a few months' time, right? So so you do get these complex. I've seen I think maybe one or two these complex Rathke's cleft cysts that can become enormous, um, and um, and nor because normally they don't enhance, right? Like a typical Rathke's cleft cyst is just a cyst that does does nothing, and um, so but not over this time scale, right? And, um, you know, like, 
um, you know, a um, you know, pituitary adenoma would also, as you said, be um, a non-secreting one would be part of the differential. Uh, abscess is, uh, so, uh, and you, you grew absolutely nothing and there's nothing on the gram stain, right? Correct, yeah, nothing, nothing grew out. Yeah, I don't think it's an abscess. I think it's something else. But mm -hmm. um, um, and and the biopsy of the wall showed just what you said. That's right. Yeah, mm -hmm. just just basically immune cell infiltration. <clears throat> and um, and uh, pituitary hypophysitis. I mean, uh, those are some of the things I, I think about. But I, I'm not sure. I, I don't. But I don't think this is. I don't think this is an abscess. Um, you can see eosinophilic granulomas can sometimes do something like this. Um, and obviously the, the germ cell tumors. Um, and um, uh, what else? Uh, th those are the sorts of things that can present with masses there. Um, lymphomas uh, can, wouldn't necessarily look like this, but yeah, that's, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not sure what that is, but I, I kind of don't think it's an abscess. But it, it'd be interesting to see what happens over time, right? If this just goes away, I, I, I'm not so sure it's going to all go away. But yeah, no. yeah, definitely. And I, I, you know, I think that part of what made them think abscess was that she did kind of have these systemic symptoms that that looked infectious. But obviously, if you've got involvement of the hypothalamus and so on, that that could be a confounder. So. Well, you know, her white count in the CSF is up a little bit, but was it actually neutrophils or was it, you know, if it was lymphocytes? No, I didn't, I didn't see that. Oh, actually I did see the differential. It was, it was fairly, it was fairly balanced. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't predominantly neutrophils. Yeah. So, 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 so I mean, sometimes the, uh, sometimes the uh, Rathke's cleft cysts or some of these cystic things can leak a little bit and, um, and cause uh, you know uh, sort of a chemical meningitis, sure. right? Um, which I think would be a little bit more in keeping in, with some of her symptoms. Um, but um, and was she was she was she treated with antibiotics before the operation? Uh, yeah, I think they had started. They gave her a dose of some antibiotics in the ER, so she was not on a prolonged course before okay. surgery, but maybe maybe for less than twenty four hours. Yeah. Okay, so I mean, you'd think you'd probably see something on gram stain if it was a real right. eclipse and, and might have grown something. That's real, yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> it's really interesting. Like fungal abscess, I guess, would be something else, but it wouldn't have that that time course. Okay, yeah. that's, that's an interesting case. Yeah. Great. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. So this is a 14 year old guy or kid who had a two month history of left shoulder pain and he had this large uh, neck or like neck mass and on the left side and so he'd been taking NSAIDs without relief of the pain and started having progressive uh, weakness and left shoulder pain and numbness um, that was in a glove-like distribution and so he presented to uh, uh, the children's hospital and so then on exam uh, he was pretty much threes and fours throughout except for like deltoid was five and then had decreased sensation to light touch in the left arm and then the entire hand. So this is what we see on MRI. Uh, there's a, a large uh, tumor that's coming out of the foramen. It's at the C6 level, um, C6-7 level. Um, and then there's this large uh, component that's um, like in this, paraspinal muscles and then kind of in the uh, brachial plexus as well. And there's also the air fluid levels too. And on CT scan, you see uh, erosion um, of the facet and then part of the uh, vertebral body as well and the lamina as well too. And, and so he got an ultrasound at uh, Nicholas Children's Hospital and uh, they did a biopsy which uh, revealed an aneurysmal bone cyst. And so I guess our uh, plan was either, given how large this tumor was and because it was, there was extension um, laterally outside the spinal canal, and then it was also anterior, uh, the decision was either anterior approach only and get it everything from the front 
um, or a posterior approach only, and then try to get everything from the back and then go through like the frame and then get everything or a combined approach. But if we did a combined approach, the question was whether we should do it uh, anterior first or posterior first and whether it should be staged and have it have a uh, have the patient do you know just one part of the surgery on one day and then come back the next day and whether the patient needed instrumentation or um, angio and embolization and yeah, so yeah well that, that that's a really uh that's a really interesting case and um so uh, just to start at the bottom, I actually would do an angio and embolization. Um, these things can really bleed. Um, not everybody agrees with that approach and we haven't always done it here. For some reason, we've seen you know, a number of these. So, um, so, that, so that would, um, so, I, so I would definitely do an angiogram and if, and if it was doable, I'd probably do uh, an embolization. Um, I think a anterior approach, um, like, the 95% of this thing is anterior. And it's also, um, you know, it's displacing the brachial plexus. And so, um, you know, I think that would be a reasonable approach and it looks large enough to me and, and the amount of bone destruction is such that, um, that I think you might be able to get back to the foramina. Um, you, you, I don't think you actually have to remove every last Bit of these, uh, you know, you know, the orthopedic surgeons see these all the time, and they will respond to a variety of different treatments. And so, you know, sometimes just sticking a needle into them um, is enough. And um, we used to a lot inject ethy block, which is something we use for pancreatic cysts, and it's alcohol and some other stuff. Um, and and you can create enough inflammation with them that they will um, decrease in size. Some, some of these annuals won't just are however aggressive. And if you do operate on them, uh, they, they often will come back if you don't remove everything you can see. And sometimes even if you can remove everything you can see that they will come back. But I don't know that I would do this all at once. Um, Cause I think, I, think, um, I think I've already seen the slides flash by if I think, and I think you guys use this kit, but um, I think I might just do the anterior operation, get out as much as I could, and then just follow him in and see what happened next. Um, because sometimes they will involute. Um, they don't all, they don't always grow. But anyways, and if you did do, okay, well let, let's let's. See. I, I mean, so it sounds like you did go post. Yeah, I mean, I shouldn't be guessing at the cases, but anyways, that, so that's what I would do. I would do an anterior approach first and then wait. So yeah, so for uh, this case, we also, we, uh, we did uh, angio and embolization like you uh, said you would have done. But for our uh, case, we actually did a stage same day approach. And so we took, a, we, uh, took him back for the posterior portion first and then did a transpedicular decompression at uh, that level and then fused from like five to one and then we uh, flipped him over and then did the anterior approach to explore the um, the part that was in the brachial plexus. Okay. So this is actually the angiogram. How, how bloody was it? Apparently it was bloodless during surgery. Yeah. Uh, thanks yeah. to the embolization. Well, yeah, I, I don't think you know, right? Uh, because as I said, we've done them without embolization and it hasn't been too bad, but it's also, we've also been in some that bleed like crazy, but so yeah, but it looks like you got a good embolization. Okay, the, yeah. The, the, the other issue uh, based on the angiogram was that this tumor had basically completely encased the vertebral artery uh, at those levels. So the other question was whether or not to sacrifice the vertebral artery or not uh, in, right. this, in this kid. And I think they, they ended up doing that, correct? Uh, I, sure. I, I can't remember. So this is uh, some interop news. So he did. Yeah, so at, uh, at the 10 week uh, post-op visit, his arm pain was much better, but he still continued to have a uh, weakness, um, same as pre-op. And see all the envo material. Yeah. Yeah. And then, the, yeah. Pre-op on the left and post-op on the right. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, so this is a two-year-old female, uh, no significant past life history. Uh, the parents reported some right upper extremity weakness, which they thought was due to some playtime accident. Uh, over the week, symptoms did not improve, and the kid continued to guard and flex the right upper extremity in favor of the left side. Uh, parents became concerned about the child to the ER, and they were con also concerned that maybe there was some shaking movement of the right upper extremity, possibly a seizure, but they weren't very sure. Uh, so on exam, left side was full strength. Uh, both her, her right heavy body was four out of five throughout. Um, did we, there was seeing some occasional rhythmic contraction of the right hand. So there was again, concern for focal seizures. Uh, so the CT scan showed this lar uh, large uh, left-sided um, uh, lesion with some hyperdensities uh, throughout. You got an MRI, uh, which again shows the same lesion. Um, there's a mass effect and then line shift. Uh, so they were taken to the OR um, for microscopic resection. And I guess in terms of discussion of this case, this uh, tumor is clearly uh, near the motor strip um, and also heavily involved with the MCA branches in terms of what uh, prophylactic uh, measures you would take in order to have a safer section. Uh, we used uh, ECOG and phase reversal to uh, accurately determine the motor strip intraoperatively and uh, intraop ultrasound to see what residual tumor was left. Um, I don't know if you had any other suggestions for a, a tumor like this. No, I, you know, I think those, I mean, we do the same thing here, I think. Um, the, um, so I just, I think this looks like to me like a very aggressive tumor. Um, it, you know, maybe something like an ATRT or um, some other malignant tumor. I mean, it, it's hyper dense on CT. Um, did it diffusion restrict on MRI? Do you know? Uh, I, I believe it did, yeah. Yeah. So um, you don't necessarily need to do a gross total um, in, in some of these very malignant tumors. It, it depends what they are. Um, and you might not know right away. I mean, these. this looks like a very vascular tumor and you know, I think one of the big considerations here would be how you're going to manage interoperative blood loss because these things can can really bleed, and you can um, you can um, you know if you're not adequately prepared, you know things can get out of control uh, pretty quickly. So I, so I would you know want to make sure that you know that all that was done beforehand, and it's not one I'd probably want to do in the middle of the night. You know, I mean, uh, occasionally these things will hemorrhage and you have to, um, but, um, you know, I think you want to be prepared for that. Um, it, it does look to me like it is in the motor strip and I don't think you'd want to chase this, um, you know, beyond, um, beyond its margins and just depending how clear the margins were from it. I think the encasement of the middle cerebral artery is really important here because um, these tumors can invade the blood vessels and um, you can get, you know, hemorrhage that's just like something with an aneurysm with these tumors. So you got to be really careful. Um, and as often as the case, I mean, this is right at the bottom of your, um, of your um, um, resection. So it's kind of, you know, in some ways it's the farthest away from you. So you got to be really careful with the middle cerebral artery branches. And for that reason, I'm not sure you could get a gross total here. And I would actually, you know, we have to we have to call for aneurysm clips. Um, and so we have a few of them here or something, but I, I, I kind of want stuff like that in the room. Like I think blood loss is a real risk here. And you and if you get one of the, if you get the middle cerebral or, you know, one of its main branches going, that's going to make things really challenging. And and that's where you, you may end up with a, with a post-op infarct. So, so I think that that is a huge um, consideration here, and um, um, yeah, but I, but I, you know, I don't think you have any choice about operating, and you know, I, I, other than just the motor evokes and things, I don't think there's anything else uh, you could do. Okay, so what what'd you find? Intraoperatively, um, they basically took all all the tumor out um, except for they found that the 
tumor around the vessels was, you know, rock hard. They couldn't separate it off the vessels. They avoided using CUSA or any uh, sharp dissection just because it was hard to see where these vessels were. Um, but they were able to get a uh, good resection, um, preserving uh, the MCA and its branches. Basically, they followed M4 all the way back to, to its uh, M M1 origin. Um, but, and she did very well post-operatively. Um, she's was seen recently in clinic. That's her most recent MRI scan. Uh, she underwent uh, chemotherapy um, and had focal radiation. They, ha they had delayed it because of her age, um, but she recently completed that in September. Um, and she was currently enrolled in this trial, um, ACNS0331, basically where uh, during the induction chemotherapy, they uh, harvest stem cells uh, so that they can transplant them back into her during her cons consolidation therapy. Uh, she's done very well. You can still, you can see the here, like all, all of her vessels are still open. There's yep. basically no residual tumor. So yeah. So so what kind of tumor was it? ATRT hit the, okay. the nail on the head. <laughs> oh, okay. No. Um. So. Um, I don't think we'd radiate this kid. She, how old is she now? She is, I believe, uh, almost four. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, we... She was two years old at the time, and so they waited almost a year before radiating her. So she's radiated at about the age of three? Yeah. So we, we probably wouldn't radiate a three-year-old. Um, it's interesting. I mean, um, it, and this is a function of the local philosophy um, um, and um, we, you know, we, I mean, I think, I think for an ATRT, we might have four, I guess, but um, our, we're really concerned about radiating kids younger than four um, and what their long-term outcome is going to look like. Um, and, um, but, but, you know, there are patients with residual ATR, so I think you guys handled this perfectly, I, you know, um, and, um, and and kids with um, uh, you know an incomplete resection can still survive. I mean, ten years ago we used to say nobody with an ATRT can survive, but that's not true. They they can, and so yeah, we'll have we'll have to see what happens. And and, and I mean, she's obviously had an excellent uh, surgical excision, and and the fact that there is no obvious residual now speaks to the idea that you don't, and just as you had done, you don't need to take everything out here necessarily. I mean, if you can get a gross total excision with an ATRT, it may improve their prognosis, but um, yeah. How much did it bleed? It, they said that they didn't have that much uh, blood loss, interestingly. Okay, yeah. All right. well, that's good. Oh, that's a great case. <clears throat> Oh, yeah. Uh, so uh, this is an eight-year-old gentleman, uh, history of uh, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis as an infant, uh, resulting in uh, cerebral palsy and significant dystonia and spasticity. Um, so at baseline, you know, he was uh, essentially, you know, wheelchair bound, although he could ambulate with a walker. Uh, could, could, can you guys, do you mind just halting for just for one second? I'm, uh... Yeah, of course. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Ready? Okay. So, um, the, over the uh, span of, so at baseline, he was ex uh, extremely uh, dystonic and spastic. Uh, the mother noticed over the past several months that he was having uh, more and more difficulty uh, ambulating with a walker. 
uh, to the point where, uh, you know, he was exclusively in the, in his, you know, wheelchair, um, all day. And she also noticed that he was no longer requiring any of his spasticity medications. Uh, he was completely weaned off his baclofen. Um, and he was also having significant difficulty holding up his head. So, uh, the neurologist, uh, referred her to us the, on a physical exam, um, you know, he was unable to support his head or neck, was diffusely hypotonic in, uh, in all four extremities. Uh, he had absent reflexes in his uppers and three plus in his lower extremities with sustained clonus. Uh, and he otherwise had no spontaneous motor response uh, in his extremities. Um, so um, initially uh, just an X-ray uh, was done, lateral X-ray was done, which you see on the left. And uh, followed by a CT scan, which you see the coronals on the left, sagittal on the right. And, and uh, ultimately his neurologist ordered an MRI, uh, which uh, you can see the sagittal. I don't, I don't know if you can see the T2, the signal change in the cord at the cervical medullary junction. Right. Uh, and the slice on the right is the axial cut at the craniocervical junction where we start beginning to see that, uh, that T2 uh, signal change. Right. Um, so that's when he came to us uh, for evaluation. Uh, he initially had seen Dr. Ragib who referred her, uh, him to uh, Dr. Niazi. Uh, so um, in, in terms of your, your considerations, um, in terms of diagnosis and uh, what you would do for this child, uh, any, just wanted uh, your thoughts. Yes. So how old, he's 80 years old. Is that right? Eight years old. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, he has an os autentoidium and he's got a uh, spinal cord injury and, um, you know, I think he needs to be stabilized. Um, I, he may not need a decompression, um, but I wouldn't hesitate to treat this kid. Um, you know, I think, Probably all, I mean, you'd have to look a little more carefully at his, his imaging, but, um, you know, he may only need a C1, C2 fusion, but you can have a discussion about going up to his occiput. Um, right. And um, I, um, I, uh, so, so, so I'm fairly conservative spine surgeon, I would say, maybe. <laughs> Um, so I, I might, so I, I think these kids are extraordinarily high risk. Um, and, um, he doesn't have a, a lot left. Um, and I, so I think however you manage them, you have to be really careful. And, and we have a Jackson table here, which we hardly ever use. Um, but this is somebody I would be really careful with how the operation was conducted and, I don't want you to gasp in horror, but I might even put him in a halo first, <laughs> just so when I flip him, I know that there isn't going to be anything untoward happen because uh, these guys are really, really on the edge. I, I think this is amongst the highest risk stuff that we do. Um, and, um, and yeah, I mean, so that's, I mean, that's, I mean, that's, I, I mean, I'd, I'd like to see what he, what he, um, uh, so that, I, I mean, I don't even know, I guess I don't know, no, I, I mean, the, um, the C-spine images, I guess, in retrospect showed that he's probably really unstable. So I don't think you need to do flexion extension views. I, I think I would just go ahead and, uh, and probably fuse him. Right. Um, so yeah, uh, Dr. Niazi uh, took him to the operating room. Um, they used uh, CT guided navigated uh, screws to place their C1 lateral mass screws and C2 PAR screws. Um, they actually didn't have to do any decompression. There wasn't much ventral dorsal compression on the MRI. I think a lot of that signal change we saw was just due to the subluxation when he flexed or extended his neck. Yeah. Um, so they didn't have to do any, uh, any uh, decompression. Um, and then after placing the instrumentation, um, they also laid out uh, allograft. Uh, as well, and uh, subsequently uh, decorticated and then uh, placed him in a halo uh, after placing the instrumentation. Uh, and if you could go to the next slide. Uh, 
So um, these are his post-op x-rays uh, mm -hmm. demonstrating his uh, lateral mass and C2 screws. You can, you can sort of see like the, the halo device that's, that he also has um, implanted. Um, so uh, just interesting you talked about conservative management. Go to the next slide. Um, this, is, this is an older study from the 1983 uh, by Spearings and Brackman. They looked at 37 patients with uh, oscillantonium and uh, 20 of them were managed uh, conservatively. And um, they found that, you know, over the long term, uh, their follow-up was ranged from seven to nine years. Um, those patients that required intervention typically had a, uh, a sagittal diameter, which they measured from the posterior border of the body of C2 and the posterior lentil arch uh, were, mo uh, were the, the, the the patient group that, that often required surgery. So if it was less than 13 millimeters, I don't know if you can see the figure I have on the right. Um, the number figure two, that number two with the, uh, the arrows, if that, if, if that measurement was less than 13 millimeters, um, they found that those children often uh, would go on to develop progressive neurological decline and require uh, C12 fusion. And I was also reading, um, you know, I guess prior to the, you know, the availability of lateral C1 lateral mass screws and hard screws, you know, prior to that, people would, would use, you know, C2 laminar screws or transarticular screws, which were, uh, would put the vertebral artery uh, more at risk. And um, two, two children actually in this study actually died uh, from uh, vertebral artery injury uh, from this review, retrospective review. Um, so I, I'm sure the, the techniques have, you know, evolved quite a bit. I mean, obviously, all we've really seen is like C1, 2 lateral uh, mass screws and far screws for, for situations like these. In what situation would you consider like an OC fusion? Um, you know, I, I, I think I would likely not do it in this case. I mean, these kids are pretty fragile, right? And they don't right. have the greatest bone quality often. Right. And, um, you know, they're, you know, non ambulators. And uh, so, you know, I, I think I would do exactly what happened here, but, um, you know, I just, you know, you only want to do this once. Um, right. but, um, and you know, if he lost some rotation, um, from side to side, it probably wouldn't affect him that much. But, um, anyways, I, I, th I think, I, I think I, I would do this. I just, um, you know, sometimes in the downs kits, we go up to the occiput just because they tend to be little harder to manage. I'm not, that's not ever been everybody's experience. The, 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 that, so, the, so I was gonna make two comments. This is, again, this is amazing cases. Um, um, I don't know that I would trust image guidance uh, right. in this situation. Um, yeah. we, you know, we obviously have it, but we tend not to use it just because um, you only have to be off by a couple of millimeters uh, and you, know, you can have a problem. So, um, you know, we, we tend to go down and expose, you know, the lateral mass of, uh, of C1 and do it, everything kind of under direct vision. And, um, and our adult spine guys who are at a different hospital, um, I'm not sure, that, I don't know how often they're using any guidance. Because I've, I've, seen, I've seen somebody put a screw right through the vertebral artery using, using image guidance. And so that's why I don't totally, so that was a transarticular screw. And as you said, that's a much higher risk, but um, I think you gotta be a little careful with image guides. So what, what are they got? One of the neurosurgeons here uh, has um, started, invented this system that rapidly updates um, cervical sp or spine um, registration using an, an, uh, an optical system. It, it's called 7D surgical. You might've seen it at some of the meetings when we used to have them. Oh, um, and it's updated in real time. And so if the vertebral body moves a little bit, um, then, you, you, then, you're, then you, everything stays regis registered. But you know, attaching a registration system you know, to the, um, to the uh, vertebrae, because this kid's quite mobile, right? right. And right. so th things are moving around a little bit here. So that's, I guess that's, the, but, but I guess the, the, the more important thing is that th this, these kids often present just like this, right? And the kids with cerebral palsy who are deteriorating and 
it gets assigned to all kinds of other stuff. And we've actually had a couple of kids here who've ended up in the ICU on a ventilator before someone realized that this is the problem that they had. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, you know, kids see that. Yeah. I, I was just gonna, sorry for interrupting. I was just going to say, I, I wasn't there for the surgery, but I was like going over the operative report and they actually mentioned that the CT was the image guidance was off. So they had to uh, pause, re-register because they were looking at the anatomical landmarks, you know, when they were placing their screws and saw a clear discrepancy of what they saw anatomically versus what the CT showed. So they had to pause, re-register, which kind of validates what you're saying about, you know, kind of trusting the anatomy as opposed to what the CT says, because you can also often be duped to trusting technology and then, you know, and then next thing you know, you're in the vertebral artery. So, um, yeah. Oh yeah, I just, this is just like some review article, another review article, which is kind of just demonstrated, you know, anterior versus dorsal compression and uh, they're just kind of discussing like indications for a trans oral, uh, like an endontidectomy if there's ventral compression. Um, I, I personally haven't seen those. I'm not sure how often um, it's necessary in cases like these, um, but uh, just another, just another uh, topic I thought, you know, was, was interesting. Um, how often do you got in Toronto, would you say, do you go be like a trans oral approach for our dantidectomy for, for cases like these? Yeah. So this was all the rage about, I don't know, 15 or 20 years ago. And I did some trans oral decompressions and I haven't, I did, I did the last one I did was for a bony tumor of the clivus, I think. Um, but I haven't done one since. So I think you hardly ever have to do it. E even if there's ventral compression, I think if, if, um, you know, it'd have to be really, really dramatic. Um, so yeah, no, we hard, I, so here we hardly ever do transoral decompressions and, and I, and I've, you know, I've sent some films, um, into Arnold Menezes, you know, Arnold, who's the, you know, got the, probably the most experienced, uh, in North America anyways, and in, in this type of problem and transoral resections. And, you know, I sent him the feeling, he says, oh, you must do, you know, a transoral decompression here. And I just didn't have the guts, right? And so I did the yeah. kid from behind and, you know, it, thank goodness it turned out okay. But so, you know, we, I got a pretty high, and just, and just because you don't do it very often, right? So, right. yeah. That's a, yeah, you can go to the next slide, thanks. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> all right, so this is a 12-year-old kid um, who was known for our service. He had been followed in clinic, um, initially presented a couple years ago with right-sided headaches. Uh, he did an MRI, which showed a right temporal arachnoid cyst, uh, no papilledema, uh, was, was kind of lost a follow-up, um, but two years later, uh, came back to clinic with persistent headaches and was scheduled for a, a follow-up MRI uh, in clinic um, uh, you know, shortly thereafter. Um, so these are uh, the initial images uh, before he's kind of lost to follow up. Uh, so you can see right temporal arachnoid uh, cyst, no significant shift or anything. Um, so kind of just a, a kind of review of, of these. Uh, usually, you know, it's unlikely for them to enlarge and there's a low rate of, uh, of rupture progression. Typically trauma is the story that, you know, we hear about these rupturing and then um, kind of causing either a subdural hematoma or, or hematoma into the, the cyst itself. Um, and so this child was managed conservatively, had no hydro hydrocephalus or papilledema. Um, so that's kind of what we did uh, in this case. Um, however, uh, shortly before, it was actually two days or two or three days before the MRI was scheduled. Uh, coincidentally, he came to the ED with um, acute worsening of his headaches, had some dizziness and gait imbalance. Uh, on exam, he was intact, you know, awake, um, just had some mild gait imbalance. Uh, adamantly denied any recent trauma. Um, ophthalmology saw him and saw no papilledema. Um, so as you can see in the in the image, he's kind of the, the cyst is ruptured. There's uh, some evidence of hemorrhage there as well, um, and he's now. Got, got a little subdural, a, a decent sized subdural there. Um, so we decided to book him. This was on a, a Friday, I guess. Uh, yeah, late Friday. Uh, decided to kind of watch him in the ICU and uh, scheduled him for surgery on Monday. Uh, however, the day after, um, 
he had worsening headaches and vomiting and therefore the decision was made to take him to the OR uh, for drainage of the subdural uh, and fenestration of the cyst. Um, the, I wasn't in the case myself, but they found um, a hematoma in the subdural space, um, then went down. There was also blood in the, in the, in the cyst region and then it was fenestrated into the optical carotid cistern. Uh, he did quite well after surgery. Uh, dizziness was resolved. He was supposed to stop scan there and uh, was discharged home without any issue. So, you know, kind of a interesting case of the fact that he had, you know, a, a rupture of this, of this cyst without any history of trauma. Um, it seems, uh, if you go to the next slide, a very un uncommonly, at least it's reported in the literature, it seems that uh, it's not too common for these cysts to rupture spontaneously. Um, and so kind of an interesting presentation and a uh, good outcome in the end. Yeah, no, those are... Uh... So, I mean, we see these all the time because somebody got an MRI for something and, um, you know, and I, I think, uh, I think, you know, 50 years later, we're still not sure what to do with these things. And um, I think, you know, the message is basically just leave them alone. But, um, but there, you know, there is, there is, uh, there is literature out there that, you know, supports, you know, treatment for headaches, for seizures, um, for, um, for, uh, uh, neurological impairment. And, uh, and, and, and I think the times that we end up treating them is usually, um, when, um, what, like this, when they rupture and I, it's, it's really interesting what you did, cause that's exactly what I would do, but my partners probably wouldn't, they probably just put in a couple of bur or a burr hole. And, and, and probably do nothing else, which I don't necessarily agree with, but um, that's, that's, I think that's what they do. I'm not sure that they would open up into the cistern. I mean, the fact that this kid's had longstanding headaches and then, um, and then has, a, has a rupture would, I, I think, because I, I don't think it's much bigger to actually go in and fenestrate it into the basal cisterns. Um, the other thing that people talk about is doing these endoscopically. And, you know, I've tried that a couple of times and I, I I hate it because um, you're working around the optic nerve with these primitive instruments, and it, the duras you or the arachnoids usually pretty thick, and um, the um, you know, and it's hard with the instruments you have to really open up things well, and with a slightly bigger incision and craniectomy um, or you know craniotomy you can actually do it open with un, with under the operating microscope and really kind of see what you're doing. So I, we've pretty much stopped doing them endoscopically. Um, the, um, I have done a couple um, for, I saw, so I, so I did one in a two-year-old, which was growing fairly rapidly. So I had increased in size and the kid had, it was on the left side and the kid had speech delay. <laughs> You know, I kind of got talked into this a little bit and, you know, the parents said, oh, his speech is way better, you know, like who, who knows, but I, but I, but I have done that. Um, and, and uh, one of my partners had a kid from, I think, South America someplace and had a large arachnoid cyst and um, an epilepsy and did the cyst and it unleashed a flurry of surgery. Uh, like, and this kid was, we have this Herbie fund that funds these kids and there's a limit, you know, and uh, it unleashed a flurry of surgery. And sometimes with an arachnoid cyst, when you operate on them, you unleash an underlying CSF disorder of some kind. And, um, and so, and, and I think, and you can end up having to shunt the patient. So, so I also think you need a fairly high threshold to, uh, to do something. And I guess the final thing is that, I don't know if you've ever seen the one-way valves that you see in a supercellular arachnoid cyst, but I, th I think there's usually a one-way valve around there someplace, that, that around one of the major blood vessels that you can see. And I've certainly seen it a number of times on a supercellular arachnoid cyst. You see this little thing that opens like a little tiny mouth on the basilar artery with every, uh, with every heartbeat. And so that, I think that that's the rationale for fenestration. So I think in those scenarios, I think that makes sense. But yeah, my just and just my partner when I started a few years back, um, he used to operate on these prophylactically because he was convinced 
that they were prone to hemorrhage. And then if you didn't do that, you're putting them at the risk for the spontaneous rupture that you're talking about here that's actually so rare. So we don't do that. But anyways, yeah. Good case. And yeah, briefly, basically what you said, you know, there is some data to support, uh, you know, microsurgical penetration as the, you know, it's, has been associated with better outcomes. So basically exactly what you said. Uh, so this is a 14-year-old male uh, with no significant past medical history who presented uh, with one month of worsening uh, daily headaches, uh, diplopia, um, when looking up or to the left, and gait change due to imbalance, um, and also left uh, hem hemibody numbness. Um, exam basically as otherwise uh, normal except for what I mentioned before. Uh, so CT head was obtained that showed severe obstructed hydrocephalus secondary to a partially calcified posterior third ventricular mass. Uh, so he was uh, then had an MRI done, uh, which showed a non-enhancing uh, diffusion restricting parapineal mass of regular margins. Um, causing inferior displacement of the midbrain. Scroll through these quickly. And then this is just showing the diffusion restriction. restriction. Yeah, I, I mean, it could also be a, like a teratoma. Like those are also reasonably common here. Mm -hmm. uh, so the patient went to a right frontal ETV. Um, the plan was for biopsy, um, but they made that decision not to do the biopsy intraoperatively because of when they saw the tumor, it was white pearly and it was consistent with epidermoid. So they knew they weren't going to get the whole thing out that way. So. Uh, two days later, the patient underwent a left parasagal craniotomy. Um, they were debating between uh, a posterior interhemisphere transcolossal approach or uh, a vertex craniotomy for a superior parietal lobule approach. I'm not sure if you prefer one of those over the others. Oh, could you go back? Could you go back one? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. You want to see? No, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, yeah, it's kind of a no man's land. Mm -hmm. um, I, I actually might go uh, posterior, you know, transtentorial. Uh, I'm kind of a one trick pony and uh, I really like that approach. Um, so I, I'd also think about that approach. Um, just trying to see where the veins are. I think they're above. Anyways, I, like in the final region, as we've already talked about, there's a million different ways to get at these, right? And everybody has their favorites. So I think the issue uh, that they ran into in this case is that they were kind of hedging their bets both ways. They were trying to do a craniotomy that would allow them to sort of try both approaches. Right. Um, they ended up doing the inner hemispheric approach only though. Uh, so their craniotomy was pretty far posterior. And so they couldn't reach and get this, this back portion here. This is the, the post-op scan here. So they, he only got a subtotal resection. Um, right, 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 yeah. Um, and so he came back recently and uh, underwent a bifrontal craniotomy uh, for an anterior transcolossal approach and they were able to get the rest of the tumor out. Right, yeah. So, and was it an epidermoid? It was, yeah. No other, no other components? Mm -mm. That's no. interesting. Yeah. He did. He did really well after the second case. Again, we were able to wean the EVD. Um, went home post op day three. Did they end up leaving some of the capsule? 
no, they got they got everything out. Okay, that's that's great. That's hard. Yeah. Uh, so another similar similar case, just an interesting presentation. Um, this is an 18 year old male with no past medical history, no psychiatric history, um, who recently graduated high school with great uh, good grades. I was brought to the ER for six weeks of progressive agitation, aggression, psychiatric disturbances, severe headache, um, seen by psychiatrists, and was started on an SSNRI. Um, when he arrived to the ED, he was ANO times one, uh, distress agitated, uh, wasn't really responding to questions well. Um, he had uh, sun setting eyes, up gaze palsy. Um, he had abnormal movements, which were uh, concerning for uh, intermittent catatonia. Um, and then they got the CT scan. Again, another third, third ventricular tumor. Um, some hyperdensity is in there. Um, so he was taken to the OR for emergent EVD. Oh, did, he have any, did he have tumor markers? He did not have tumor markers. Um, at the time, I don't believe. Uh, so they, yeah, so they, they did not get any, uh, they, the CSF was negative for any tumor markers. They ended up doing ETV okay. and endoscopic biopsy okay. using the flexible endoscope. Um, and so it was found to be a German noma. So that was, they didn't do any uh, other extensive surgery. Um, just presenting this case because it's an interesting presentation for a yeah. germanoma causing yeah. psychiatric disturbances. Yeah. Um, and they, uh, his psychiatric disturbances improved postoperatively with treatment, um, but he's not completely back to normal. I don't, I don't know if you've ever seen anything quite like this, just because I know a lot of the dopaminergic pathways are up in the, you know, dorsal midbrain. Um, uh, so I haven't seen that, but you can get these um, uh, germanomas in the thalamus that present with some very strange uh, presentations and, you know, hemiparesis and some really weird stuff. And this one looks like it's created a lot of edema in the thalamus. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, don't, I, I, don't, I can't say I've ever seen a presentation like that, but yeah, here you go. Um, yeah, well. Uh, well, uh, last case, this is similar to another case that we presented earlier. Um, 16 year old male with cerebral palsy, spastic uh, quadriparesis with worsening respiratory drive and decreased motor function. Um, again, you see anterior displacement of C1 on C2, some uh, uh, auditorium here. Um, this uh, due to his respiratory compromise, inability to be prone, he was placed in a halo for one month and then underwent a C12 fusion. Um, this is post traction. Um, this is his post op imaging. Um, he was not in a halo afterwards, and due to his severe spasticity, um, the patient was also very malnourished, very, uh, with a lot of wasting. Um, he was found to have pseudoarthrosis at C2. As you can see here, the screw uh, totally came out. Um, so they extended the fusion down to uh, C5. Um, and again, due to his spasticity, poor nutrition, um, he had settling of his occiput. As you can see here, the the uh, rod actually started to dig into his occiput um, and cause erosion of the bone there. Um, and so he underwent an occiput to C2 fusion. Um, and that so far has taken place. I guess the questions here, um, in a patient like this who has very uh, diffuse spasticity, that poor nutrition, um, would you have put a G-tube in early to make sure he's nutritionally optimized? Uh, we did the halo initially, but would you keep him in a halo postoperatively, uh, obviously fusing to the occiput initially and whether or not Botox inje injections would have been beneficial to prevent him from basically pulling out and causing failure of the screws in the initial surgery? Yeah, so I, I think as we, this is a perfect example of just how fragile these kids are and 
and they are kind of little kegs of dynamite. And um, so, you know, I think um, as long as you can control them, I think, you know, taking some time to see if you can optimize his nutrition, I, I would, I would, I think have put them in a halo too. And, and sometimes what I've done with these kids when they're really bad, you know, that they, they're, you know, they've got an os, but they're flexed and there's cord indentation and so on. Like, I think those are really high risk. So then I would actually, like, you guys are making me feel better because I feel like, you know, nobody uses a halo anymore, but I, I would actually put them in halo traction and see if I could reduce them, you know, do an MRI with him fixed in the halo. And then I would, we would probably leave them in the halo afterwards. Um, I think you could still start with a C1, C2 fusion, but I would have gone up rather than down when that didn't work. But uh, anyways, um, yeah, the, uh, the, no, these, these kids are really, uh, really high risk. And, um, you know, I, I've got one patient early on in my career um, who, you know, was, I was partially involved um, and was presented against, you know, cerebral palsy, spasticity, C1, C2 subluxation. I can't remember if they have an OS or not. It was a long, long time ago. And um, anyways, let's just, let's just say in the end that she ended up in a ventilator, right? And that, that's a ventilator for life. Right, so you just have to have just have to have one of these in your career, right? So I maybe that's why I kind of overreact, but I'm I'm I really regard these kids as, as high risk, anyways. Guys, so those were fabulous cases. I, I want to thank you, and you really presented them well. And um, you know, you didn't nail me to the wall. You know, I appreciate that. That's... no, we we appreciate you taking the time to walk through all these cases with us. It was nice to hear. A, a different input and see how you would ha handle all of these cases. Yeah. So do you guys want to ask me anything? I mean, I don't I have a few minutes left, whatever, whatever works for you guys, but um, I don't know. Any questions I can answer for you? I, I guess I had a quick question. I, what really interested me from your talk was the, the I guess, uh, I forget the term you used, like the standalone robot that basically what you could inject and wasn't attached yeah. to, uh, I guess, in terms of, clinical applications in neurosurgery, what, what, how do you foresee that being used? Yeah, so I mean, it's somewhat sci-fi, I suppose, but um, you know, the, the engineer I'm working with is a very, very smart guy. He thinks that there are, and there are other kind of, in, there are other kind of injectable magnetic robots that are out there. So they use them in the GI tract and, um, there's a, a, a engineer in uh, in uh, Quebec who um, has these bacteria that he attaches nanoparticles to, and in an animal model he can inject them and have them go to a tumor. So uh, and, and it's it's and they're magnet and they're and you can you actually can make magnetic bacteria. There are magnetic bacteria. So. I think it's kind of on that continuum. I mean, it's kind of a proof of concept, I guess. And, uh, you know, could you actually stick, you know, just inject one of these into the, into the spinal canal and then have it go up and, you know, and go in there and take out a tumor or something? I, I don't know. It, it, I think it's more of a proof of concept. Yeah. Well, I was wondering, it, you know, a, a lot of the discussion, I think, in terms of ETV, CPC versus initial shunting, a lot of the question is how much of the choroid plexus are you actually cauterizing? Because a lot of times the uh, choroid plexus is in hard to reach area. So I'm wondering, you could technically use this, you know, robot to go through the ventricle system and get to those hard to reach places. And maybe that would uh, increase their success, but uh, just, yeah. just yeah, no, thinking I mean, out. <laughs> it's metal, you could heat it up, right? And, right. Uh, but yeah, no, I mean, it's right now, it's kind of proof of concept. Okay. It was a very interesting talk, thank you. No, no problem. It's fun. It's nice to meet you guys. Good. I think we're, we're good. Okay, so I'll just make one final pitch. Uh, if you are interested in pediatrics, uh, give us a look. Okay, we have a pretty good fellowship program here. Um, a lot of our uh, U of T people, as you know, have gone down there for either a fellowship and or stayed. 
<laughs> so we have a really good relationship. And, um, you know, you know what Toronto people look like, and we know what Miami people look like. So, uh, <laughs> you know, so anyways, give us a look. But I really appreciate you spending the time with me. I really enjoyed it. And um, you guys take care. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for your time again. Bye. Bye.